Welcome to the Psychedelic Passage Podcast. My name is Jimmy Wynn. I'll be your host today. Thanks for joining us on another weekly installment. I think today's conversation is going to be really valuable to folks. I know I say that every week, but that's like the goal of our podcast is to continue to provide value, dialogue, conversation to the psychedelic space in a way that is meaningful for our listeners and community. And I'll share a little bit about our guests who arguably will likely will know more than I will ever know about psychotropic medications and interactions with uh, psychedelics. And I'm very, very honored and happy to have Ben Malcolm on our episode today. So, uh, Dr. Malcolm earned his master's in public health and doctorate of pharmacy, a PharmD at Turo University, California. He then completed postgraduate residencies in acute care at Scripps Mercy Hospital and psychiatric pharmacy at the University, University of California at San Diego Health. He founded the website spiritpharmacist.com and currently works as a psychopharmacology consultant and psychedelic educator. Ben envisions a society where access to psychedelic drugs in a variety of safe and supported settings are available for purposes of psychospiritual well-being, personal development, ceremonial sacraments, and the treatment of mental illness. And his vision guides his clinical and educational service related professional activity. So Ben, thank you so much for being on our show. It's really wonderful to be here, Jimmy. Yeah, we 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 first met, well, I think I've I've had you on, you know, my radar for a couple of years. And I, I thought it was really great that there were, you know, farm D's such as yourself wanting to share their expertise and knowledge in in the psychedelic space. And over over time we've been in you know, meetings and groups, you know, here and there. And I've, I've really just come to appreciate not only your wealth of information, but your your ability to uh, kind of like distill it down into terms that people can actually, you know, understand. That's a hard balance sometimes to really know all of the codes in the matrix, you know, all the things that, that are running in the background and then being able to like distill it. So just really, really appreciative of you being here. I, I wonder if you're just open to you know, sharing a little bit with the audience so that they can get to know you better. How did, you know, coming from your public health background and your doctorate of pharmacy, curious if you can share anything about how that intersects with psychedelics for you. Yeah, sure. So I did a doctorate of pharmacy. That's a four year program. I did a master's in public health at the same time. And I focused on global public health during that, that master's degree. I did a couple of years of postgraduate residency training. So I just did one in acute care in a hospital setting. And then I did a second one at UCSD Health in psychiatric pharmacy. So I think that's it when so someone says, I'm a psychiatric pharmacist. Like, what does that really mean? Well, it means that I did the standard doctorate of pharmacy training. And it means that I have specialized training and knowledge in psychiatry. And some of that happened through residency and some of that happened in academia. I worked as an academician teaching psychiatric pharmacy, practicing inpatient psychiatric pharmacy during those four, four and a half years or, or so that I was doing that. Mm. But I would say like, like, how did I become a psychiatric pharmacist? Like, why were you interested in um, pharmacy, drugs, psychoactives, and then psychedelics? I mean, that story predates pharmacy school by a long shot, really. I would say I had just a natural curiosity both intellectual and experiential in my in my teenage years, which really kind of drove my educational path in undergraduate. Well, I got a bachelor's in science and, and pharmacology, and I kind of selected that because it was already something that I just liked to learn about. So I would say that psychedelics and my interest in psychoactives was really just around at the beginning of the of the day. And I went on a pretty long educational endeavor. You know, if you do four years of undergraduate, four years of pharmacy school, two years of residency, I mean, that's 10 years of, of education and training um, related to that kind of like field or area. And in that kind of period, that 10 years of education and training, the landscape around psychedelics changed so much as far as the research environment. Uh, you know, Spravato or S-ketamine was more or less uh, approved in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And uh, ketamine and MDMA, or I should say psilocybin and MDMA, were given breakthrough designations by the FDA. There are, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. 
which allows for the possibility of, of fast tracking, right? Yeah. Well, basically the breakthrough designation from the FDA sort of, it's a recognition that, you know, this is sort of a novel modality. So it's not another SSRI or similar type of of medication. Like this is truly like novel as far as like the modality or intervention. And from preliminary types of data, it really seems that it could offer major advantages over existing treatment options. Like that's essentially the kinds of qualities in a drug therapy that the FDA looks at to give a, a breakthrough designation. So really, by the time I finished my psychiatric pharmacy training uh, around 2016 or so, there was a new opportunity, I felt like, for pharmacy and for pharmacists, because there really was you know, phase two, phase three data with some of these compounds. There's like real efficacy and safety information to start discussing not to mention the sort of just wealth of observational kind of research and historical or even anthropologic type of information about some of these substances because they've been around just for so long overall. So I just felt like there was a real opportunity at that point in time that intersected with my natural interests and what I was essentially trained to do. And I've kind of taken it and, and really run with it. It makes a lot of sense that you'd spent that time in academia based on what I was sharing about my appreciation of your ability to like communicate and distill and teach and and some of those things. And you must have a pretty fascinating uh, relationship with psychedelics, given that you do have this pharmacological background. And so I'm sure that that's a big lens in which you view the world, which like not everybody has that if they're going through their own personal you know, psychedelic journeys and experiences and things like that. And so I'm curious to what degree, you know, your background, educational background, career and all that, how has that influenced or shaped your own experience with with psychedelics at all? Oh, it surely has. You know, I think that you have psychedelic experiences that you then integrate into your life, but the psychedelic experience integrates your life. Like like it, 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 it feels not just like one process where the integration flows from the experience. I mean, I really feel that the psychedelics integrate my life experiences and I don't know, taking that big picture look at uh, at one's life and how one's doing in different sorts of areas and really taking inventory or stock of, of, of oneself feels to inherently be important and probably like one of the most beneficial things that psychedelics can reliably kind of, of do for me. Hmm. Not that they can't do, do other types of things. But as far as like, you know, my practice, my consulting, things like that, I would say that it's definitely informed and shaped by my own experience with psychedelics, but it's not necessarily what I try to base it on. Like I really try to kind of focus and base it on the types of data or information is out there because I truly believe that that information source is always going to be better than whatever happened to me or whatever my kind of story is, which is largely a reflection of who I am and what's going on in my life and and things like that. I would say that persons probably consult with me because I have this kind of like broader scope of scientific knowledge and I've really spent a lot of time reviewing data and literature around psychedelics to to get this more, I would say, broad, informed perspective around it. But, you know, I think it would be a little disingenuous to say that my own experiences don't shape how I present information at times, or, or I don't rely on that when talking about differences in subjective effects between compounds and things like that. So there's, there's really kind of a hybridization, I think, of being the data man and being a person that has experienced some of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really fascinating to me that you can have that real deep, like scientific insight, and then still tap into a, a lot of that intangible, indescribable aspects of, you know, psychedelics, I, I would imagine that once you kind of know the background processes of things, I, I, I wonder that balance of how that might shape your psychedelic experiences, but it actually seems like it's it's quite the reverse that these psychedelic experiences are actually informing, not only, like you said, the integration of your life, but how you convey and deliver information. And and the, the last part that you said, 
Um, I totally agree with the majority of what folks have to rely on is anecdotal information or information that's passed down if you're lucky through generational knowledge of, you know, psychedelic use, but that's not like very common in, in our society. And, you know, even if you were a facilitator who have served hundreds and hundreds of folks and dosing questions and all of those things, you're still left with I would call it the the art and science of, you know, properly dosing and considering, you know, different medications and things. And so uh, maybe if, if you're open to it, if you could just break down broadly the relationship between psychotropic medications and psychedelic effects. So to give some context, um, you know, psychedelics have the, you know, potential to treat symptomatic uh, effects of mental, you know, health conditions. By the way, this episode is not to be misconstrued for any medical or mental health advice. Really, this is for educational purposes only in the effort to try to get individuals to uh, advocate for themselves and know what to ask for and get the information so that they can make their own informed decisions. And if that requires the guidance of your prescribing med- professional or your medical professional or mental health professional, we always urge you to do that. So um, for many of those folks who are viewing psychedelics as a potential for uh, addressing a mental health a symptom or issue, a lot of those folks are on psychotropic medications, uh, particularly the serotonergic medications. These are anxiety medications, different types of, as I mentioned, serotonergic medications. So can you give folks like just a a rundown on that, you know, relationship somewhat as as like a primer for, you know, some other questions I'll be asking you today? Yeah, I think overall, it's not incredibly well defined what the relationship between psychiatric medications or psychotropics and, and psychedelics really is. I think that you have a lot of psychotropic medications that are working through serotonin-based mechanisms as well. Things like SSRI or SNRI antidepressants, things like atypical antipsychotics, things like Boosperone. Even some uh, sleep aid types of medications like Trazodone have serotonergic mechanisms that appear to be somewhat counterproductive to the mechanisms or at least the mechanisms that create the subjective effects around psychedelic experiences, particularly serotonin-based psychedelics like psilocybin, MDMA, LSD. So for the most part, it kind of seems like they're set up to be kind of counterproductive or maybe even competitors in the marketplace when you know MDMA or, or psilocybin is approved. But there are exceptions here, for example, with ayahuasca that contains monoamine oxidase inhibitors, a lot of those serotonin reuptake blocking types of antidepressants are going to become dangerous as far as a contraindication, whereas with something like MDMA or psilocybin, at least at this point in time, uh, it seems that it's much more of a counterproductive kind of interaction as far as the subjective effect or even some of the physical responses to, to ingesting the psychedelic. You know, there are Maybe I would say like in the world, particularly in the world of of psychedelics, but maybe just the world sort of like broadly, psychiatric illness, psychiatric medications, they carry a lot of uh, stigma to them. And I don't know, like, I, I think that there is some truth in this. And I think that it's also like a very hyperbolic kind of of truth or a reductionist truth within the psychedelic community that sort of says that well, psychedelics are about getting to the etiology, the very root causes of why you feel the way they feel. And they can kind of unearth those emotions and sort of like pluck it like a weed from the garden and almost expect these long-term persistent improvements in mental health that might be curative, right? It's like we went to the etiology and we really cured it. Whereas the psychiatric medications, it's a different sort of model. It's more of a daily medication type of model. And in this model, we are reducing symptoms and increasing functionality, which does, you know, help a person to an extent, but they're not really getting to that kind of like root cause or, or ideology. And I, yeah, to an extent, I think that's true. And I also have met several people that use psychedelics on some regular basis because the symptoms do come back after a period of time. And it really seems to clear their symptoms for a period of time, but the symptoms do come back. So kind of thinking of it as like, well, that's just a curative for them doesn't seem to be 100% true. 
And then I also meet people that start an SSRI type of antidepressant and go out and get some therapy and maybe work with a personal trainer, nutritionist and change their diet and really integrate their mental health treatment into other aspects of their lives and find themselves with really nice reductions of symptoms, sometimes to the point that they really can taper and live pretty well off of the medications as well. So I think overall, how compatible they are, what is the overall role of function of these things? How similar or dissimilar are they? Yeah. You know, there are similarities between, there are differences between them. You know, there is a way that psychedelics lean more towards, I think, like emotional catharsis, which really clears symptoms and makes persons feel better for, for a good period of time with a really limited or intermittent kind of administration, mm. right? So it does paint a more like, man, we're getting closer to cure, like sustained long-term ad- remission from, you know, a few doses that are spaced a month apart. I mean, that's atypical in the world of drugs or medications most of the time you're taking a drug consistently to reduce symptoms and improve functionality. And that's not just SSRI antidepressants, that you, that's your blood pressure medications, mm. that's your cholesterol drugs, that's your blood thinners. Like, like that's, that's the model of how drugs work most of the time. It's really rare to take a drug and get a persistent long-term effect after the drug has gone from, from the body. That's almost like the exception to the rule. And from that angle, it really does seem like we're entering a new paradigm in mental health and psychiatry is that it, it certainly works and it certainly works differently. But what is the relationship to, to psychotropics? It probably just depends on the person, their illnesses and their relationship to psychotropics, because that's a highly variable thing. I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, Oftentimes, I think when folks are looking at anything related to the realms of, I guess, healing an ailment, I want to be, you know, careful here. But anytime that somebody wants to like look into improving themselves, or whether it's, you know, cast as a mental health thing, or, you know, a chronic like medical thing, a a lot of times folks are looking at themselves in a vacuum, like this is just me and my body and so on and so forth. And and I appreciate a lot of the, the narrative around this type of care, uh, talking about more than that. And I'm hearing you say, well, there's like life conditions and um, other habits and patterns, um, the uh, history of the individual, maybe that person's access to medical and mental health care. And so all of that creates this Uh, landscape in which it does create a little bit of this uh, variability, you know, among folks. And and the other thing I really, really like about what you said is that it's really easy for humans to try to like simplify this into into terms and trends that we can understand the the prescriptive nature of what you're talking about with medications, where it's like you take a medication during its active effect, it's going to do this with the symptoms Then once it wears off your, you know, and then psychedelics are so different from that, as you were mentioning that there appears to be the potential for sustained effect, even after the substance itself has, you know, moved through your your body. And it's easy to say, that, oh, all antidepressants and psychotropic medications will dull your life or get you disconnected from your feelings and, you know, your emotions and some of those things. And can, but I, I, I talk to folks every day who, have, who are on psychotropic medications and it's a real benefit to them having an active participation in their life. I talk to folks where it is a little bit, you know, debilitating or they feel like they're somewhat like floating through or like kind of checked out from their body, their feelings, and 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 their you know emotions, and so I also really like what you said. Um, the the caution for folks that generally serotonergic medications and MAOIs can present a real risk. You know, I think about like serotonin syndrome and you know potential real potential harm to to an individual with that. And then on the other piece of it with other serotonergic psychedelics, it seems to, I think the word that you use, it seems to have like a counter effect, which which in here we talk about the strength of the psychedelic experience or that, that serotonergic medications can sometimes negate or dull or dampen the experience itself. And then there's a lot of arguments to this because we don't know what's happening in the unconscious of an individual. Like they are obviously still taking a certain 
amount of, you know, let's say psilocybin mushrooms. And even if they are not having a, like you said, a subjective effect, I really appreciate that word. We don't have enough research and study to know like what else is going on back there. And so a lot of folks who explore psychedelics, they run into this like choice or decision which which I think the conversation even five years ago was like, oh, you have to taper off of medications in order to have a psychedelic experience. Now we know that that is not always true. I'm wondering if you could just speak on that, you know, a, a little bit. Is that substance dependent? Is it individual dependent? Is it, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think we're getting closer to the truth, right? I think that maybe 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, to be honest, when I went to different types of forums and social media and things like that. And, you know, can I eat mushrooms while taking antidepressant? Like not that long ago, like 10 or 15 years ago, it was, no, you will die of serotonin syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I argued a little bit for a while and then just realized that there was absolutely no way I was convincing anyone through a comment on Facebook of anything, spinning wheels and and wasting time. So I thought, what can I do about this? And that's actually a little bit how, you know, I do consulting, like kind of as my background as a clinical pharmacist, but I was in academia. I've done like literature synthesis. So academic blogging to kind of weigh in, like, what is my opinion or what is the current state of research about some of these things was a big part of it because it just inherently felt a lot more powerful to me to create some kind of page that really laid out the arguments and where the information came from. And then every time you get one of these, well, you'll die. It's like, well, you know, here's all of this information about why you probably won't die. And you may actually get reduced amount of, of subjective effects. So I'm pretty happy. Like, honestly, like most of the time I get emails from facilitators now, it really is with this narrative of like, what should we do because of the counterproductive effect? So I'm like happy to ha actually seen the evolution of the psychedelic community to go from, we can't do that because it's incredibly dangerous to, we can't do that because of loss of efficacy. And now I think we're really getting somewhere close to the, the truth as far as, well, a good percentage of the people are going to report reduced effects when uh, I'm going to take a specific example now, like mixing an SSRI or SNRI antidepressant with psilocybin uh, containing mushrooms. Like a lot of people are going to notice some reduction in effects, but whether that's a deal breaker for you is very unclear. Probably 25 or 30 percent, they just remain sensitive. Maybe 50% do notice some diminished effects, but half of them can take a higher dose and still get pretty close to the a level of effect that they want. Whereas maybe the other half of, of persons, for whatever reasons, can't get the, uh, the effects where they want. And I really say for whatever reasons, because I think psilocybin mushrooms are also kind of finicky and have met a few people that fail to launch without any sorts of obvious reasons, like they're taking an antidepressant medi medication. So there could just be more complexity to mushrooms. You know, psilocybin is a pro drug. It needs to be metabolized by psilocin. There could be conversion related issues. There could be absorption related issues. There could just be genetic SNPs or polymorphisms and serotonin receptors that limit the amount of response persons can get to certain types of, of psychedelics overall. So at this point in time, if you're taking an SSRI or SNRI antidepressant and you're thinking of a psilocybin mushroom experience, I think that it is really an individual decision about whether you want to taper for that experience, perhaps based on other motivations. Like I'm looking for other motivations and reasons for persons to, to taper, to think that that's really like a great route for them to, to go down. So for example, I get someone that I started an antidepressant six, eight, 10 years ago at more or less a time of crisis in my, in my life. And it was helpful for stabilizing that crisis. Since then I've done X, Y, Z started a meditation practice, et cetera. I'm feeling quite a bit better now. And, you know, I'm really curious kind of like what's underneath this, this medication. And I'm feeling like it's a good season and time overall in my life to uh, attempt a discontinuation with uh, antidepressants. And I've just been reading a lot about psychedelics and how they could be an alternative or Maybe I'm just kind of seeking some of the spiritual aspects of, of a psychedelic experience more than like a mental health treatment aspect because I've come quite a ways. Mm -hmm. You know, do I have to taper? And it's like, well, 
it sort of seems like there's other reasons and motivations in your life that would naturally make you think that it's a good time to taper the antidepressant. And in that situation, it really kind of seems that, I mean, it seems safe to attempt to taper. And it seems like there are reasons beyond just using psychedelics. Whereas somebody else, maybe I started that medication for the crisis one year ago, and some of the factors have changed, but some of the factors persist. And yeah, that medication took the edge off some of the symptoms, but frankly, I'm still left with a lot of symptoms. And uh, I tried a 25% dose reduction a couple of months ago, and it really didn't go well. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that I could proceed here? And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, you know, I'm not sure how sensitive they will be to psilocybin mushrooms while taking the antidepressant. I'm wondering if persons can do what I call like a dose testing kind of practical sure. approach where they start with microdoses, which are arguably sub perceptual. So they may not feel much there, but it's likely going to be safe and not overwhelming to try that when they have four to six hours to themselves or with a close friend nearby, not operating heavy machinery and giving the presentation of your <laughs> life at work and things <laughs> like that. But right. Some time where you may be able to notice some subtle level of of effect and if there's more effect than you're expecting then it's still going to be totally safe for for the person and if they start getting responses at small doses within the microdosing range or maybe you know up to to fold the upper limit of the microdosing sure. range like like half a gram six tenths of a gram of dried mushrooms they're getting effects there i generally think that there is a way of getting them to a pretty potent full dose psychedelic experience while remaining on the antidepressant. Whereas if they really start going through some of those test dosing processes and they're up to six, seven tenths of a gram of dried mushrooms and absolutely Zippo is happening for them, Mm -hmm. I think that makes it reasonably clear that they probably will need to taper and wash out the medication to restore effects of psilocybin. Or if they're not ready for that process for whatever reason, there are other options. Ketamine is totally compatible with SSRI or SNRI types of of antidepressants and could offer a non-ordinary state that does sort of produce a persistent effect beyond the time that it's administered. And there are differences between the modalities, definitely. But I guess what I'm saying is that with at least with psilocybin mushrooms and SSRI or SNRI antidepressants, I really consider it an individual's decision based on the season of their life, what they want to do with their antidepressant, their Mm -hmm. sensitivity to mushrooms while taking antidepressants. And that's kind of where we get into art and science, right? There's just no rote answer as far as like, Mm -hmm. you want to eat mushrooms, you're taking antidepressants, auto taper, wash out for a month, everyone does the same thing. Like the data makes it seem like it's not that way even now. I think that there is a lot more information that's going to come about about this interaction of like optimal approaches. But I am expecting that at the end of the day, it's going to boil down to an individual decision. I really think that that's the paradigm that I'm trying to dismantle, that there is a like a prescriptive one size fits all protocol on how folks move through psychedelic experiences, especially regarding any decisions on what to do with their medications and you know just hearing that what you're saying is that it really distills down into the individual that really aligns with my perspective because i've certainly had clients decide to move forward while fully on their medications maybe they're just uh, appreciating that stability or that effect or you know whatnot i've also had folks who knew that it was going to be really challenging to taper down and whatnot but they were maybe feeling a desire to just ensure that they are going to have an alter an experience of an altered state of consciousness. Uh, and then other folks who just acknowledge like, okay, I'm going to stay on my medications, but maybe I will need two, three X, you know, the, the dosage. And it's really cool now because we have things like Q tests that can help to quantify, you know, percentages of psilocybin content in mushrooms. We just have so many things now that we really didn't have access to, you know, many years and, and, and decades ago. And I just acknowledge that there are folks out there who are trying to figure out their relationship with their own medications in conjunction with, you know, intentional psychedelic use. And oftentimes I find that that folks who are taking medications for a very long time, maybe feeling some type of symptomatic relief or benefits, but they don't realize it or notice it. So there are a lot of folks who are like, oh, 
I'm going to taper off of these medications. They're not really doing anything for me anyways. And then when they start a tapering process and they potentially go through withdrawal symptoms and whatnot, they're like, oh, maybe these things are actually doing something anyway. So I think that also speaks to that like subjective effect that you're talking about. And, and for folks who are exploring, you know, tapering, I'm wondering what typical durations look like for SSRIs specifically or, or just serotonergic, you know, psychotropic medications in general. Like what, what are you seeing out there as far as, you know, ranges of, of tapering protocols? I mean, I would say like standard psychiatric guidance is actually quite aggressive and pretty quick. I mean, some of the prescribing guidelines might say things like reduce the dose of antidepressant by 25% every four to seven days, which is for a person that's been taking an antidepressant for years at not the lowest doses. I do think that that is probably overly aggressive and sets them up for a lot of withdrawal symptoms and a really sort of rough period if they're even able to make it to the point where they're off of their their antidepressant. It feels a little bit like yo-yo dieting to me to kind sure. of like take an antidepressant for eight years and then try to taper off of it over two to four weeks. It really mm-hmm. sort of feels like, well, some people will be successful in losing weight through a yo-yo diet, but but what percentage of people are successful in keeping the weight off from yo-yo diets, right? Mm-hmm. Like not very many of them overall. So I would encourage persons to take a little longer than that real minimal time frame of about a month to to taper off. I think that 10 to 25% dose reductions every 2 to 4 weeks as tolerated is kind of my standard guidance. And within that, you have quite a bit of variability. If you take 25% reductions every two weeks, that's about a two-month taper plan. Mm -hmm. If you take 10% reductions every four weeks, that's a 10-month taper plan, right? So I'm sort of thinking that if you've been taking SSRI or SNRI types of antidepressants for a year or, or longer, uh, you probably want to budget two to four months as far as an initial, uh, taper attempt or taper strategy. And be willing to adjust that plan if things get quite challenging or difficult at some point and kind of maybe go a little bit slower or space things out a little bit farther. There are these, I would say, like websites out there, uh, survivingantidepressants.org and I love that related website. websites yeah. that really talk about a rule of about 10%. Whereas if you go above 10% dose reductions, then the likelihood of encountering withdrawal or maybe even intolerable levels of withdrawal tends to go up, whereas 10% or lower dose reductions tends to be better tolerated. I personally feel like those 10% reductions are they're pretty tedious and they take really long periods of time overall. And I would suspect that there is a bias on those websites towards people that are incredibly sensitive to withdrawal or have a much more Maybe difficult more time tapering mm-hmm. than others, right? I think most of the people that, well, it was a bit of a challenge and there was a few hiccups along the road, but you know, I taper off over two or three or four months. They're, they're not going to be on that website saying about how horrific it was and things like that. There really is almost like a self-selecting, I think, phenomena for persons that have a very difficult time, which is an important voice in this conversation because I think it's been a voice that's been really minimized by the psychiatric community. I think it has been this, oh yeah, well, that's not, it doesn't cause any kind of physical dependence. And yeah, you can quit that over a few weeks and, you know, no harm, no foul is going to be real easy for you. And a lot of people find like, I can't do that. Like I cannot Mm -hmm. take 25% dose reductions and feel good enough to keep going on this taper process. And I'm, I'm afraid, like I'm Mm -hmm. afraid to take dose reductions now. And I, don't feel like my provider is very supportive because the last time I tried it and I got intense withdrawal symptoms, they just looked at me and said, see, that's your illness and you need to be on this for the rest of your life. Mm. And I mean, okay, uh, antidepressants are are not controlled substances. There's many, many differences between the types of compounds, but just for an illustrative purpose, right? Imagine I was taking morphine on a daily basis and then I took a 50% reduction in my morphine dose. And three days later, I was in total body pain and sick as a dog. And the doctor looked at me and said, see, this is your pain condition. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's an opioid withdrawal condition. Like it's really clear in that example what it is. 
but because antidepressants produce neuroadaptive effects over weeks and they're not controlled substances and they're not thought of as, you know, highly addictive compounds with, you know, acute intense withdrawal That's syndrome, so interesting. then, then it yeah. gets sort of like just swept aside and left out of the conversation where, so I, I would say for anyone listening to this, that's maybe tried an antidepressant taper in the past and they've initially gone with like a 25 to 50% dose reduction and just kind of like run into a barrier that you may have just been a bit too aggressive out of the gate. And it may not really mean that tapering is an impossible task for you or you're too sensitive to dose reduce or that what you experience with that dose reduction has anything to do with your underlying illness overall. And you may want to back up and take a much slower approach and see how things unfold differently. It's a bummer, right, to have a console because you've got your psilocybin experience scheduled five, six weeks from now, and I really need to get off of it and really need to wash it out for some period of time. And so there's a lot of reverse engineering that people do based on experience dates, and then it kind of puts them on a pretty aggressive, maybe just hyper aggressive schedule as far as as tapering. And, you know, if we compromise the psychological stability of the person in that tapering process, then you start to wonder about the candidacy for the psychedelic experience itself. You know, if we could be blowing people up for these experiences or you know, maybe the experience itself is still sort of helpful and therapeutic, but then in the next week, they're just kind of hit with this train of withdrawal symptoms and then kind of wondering, oh, what is this? Like, did, did this experience mess me up? I mm-hmm. felt great in the experience. I felt great for 12 hours afterwards. Two, three days later, I am in the worst place I've been in a very, very, very long time. What happened? Did it make me worse? And I don't know. Do you want to go back on their antidepressant or... It makes it a confusing kind of situation. So I really do think that the safety and benefits of psychedelic therapy is going to largely depend on what we decide to do with psychiatric medications ahead of time. And I think that the faster we move and the more abrupt things are, then it is going to increase the risk of post-acute sort of like problems with psychedelics or maybe just confusing situations where they just cannot tolerate life without the antidepressant for long enough to have the few experiences and guided settings that they probably really do need to get themselves out of the illness zone and kind of closer to a wellness space. There are a couple of of assumptions I think that folks take when they are maybe first timers and experiencing psychedelics in an intentional context, or maybe folks who had, you know, played around recreationally in their younger years and are circling back and One of the things is that there's a lot of emphasis on one experience or one ceremony or one dosing session. And I think there's actually a lot of intelligence in folks um, not putting that much pressure on one experience and maybe having moderate dose experiences or returning back to the medicine, you know, at a certain frequency. And that just creates dynamic and challenges for folks, especially on, you know, medications and I really love what you said before about, you know, we, uh, myself and Nick, we always say uh, most (laughs) prescribing doctors are way better at prescribing than they are helping folks to get off of the, of the medications. And the challenging, you know, part around this is if we were looking at this like an opioid addiction or an alcohol uh, tapering. It would be unheard of to tell somebody, oh, yeah, in a month, just like get off of your stuff. And so I actually really appreciate what you were saying in the beginning of your share, because that actually kind of speaks to a part of the stigma around psychotropic medications. Like you said, that they they aren't recognized as a controlled substance and some of those things. So they're not regarded, you know, the same. And the other thing that's coming up for me is that it really depends on the individual's goal and plan. So like if they are trying to taper down to zero before a psychedelic experience. Why is that? Is there a plan for an option for them to get back on their medications? Or maybe they want to taper down to half of their, you know, dosage just to have a little bit of assurance that they're going to have some type of effect with psychedelics. Well, that's a whole different game and and all of that. I'm, I'm curious for you, do you find any difference across different types of antidepressants as far as as tapering and then effect with for this conversation like psilocybin mushrooms like there's just different ones out obviously we talked about maois 
SSRI, ser- selective serotonin reuptake in- inhibitors, uh, SNRIs, which are kind of common. And then I hear other things like tricyclics, which I think is is maybe like a quote unquote older version of antidepressants. Uh, does that make any difference there for you? I think it does. I mean, uh, the tricyclics are prescribed a whole lot less than SSRIs or SNRIs at this point. And the only piece of information we really have about it is a observational study by Kit Bonson from the late 90s talking about how, I forget how many people, 6, 10 maybe, that are on different types of tricyclic antidepressants overall report potentiated effects of LSD, which is sort of just opposed to what the SSRIs or SNRIs seem to be reported to cause. But the tricyclics also block serotonin reuptake. So what is it about their pharmacology that antidepressants don't have that could change these responses? Or is it something to do with LSD? Basically, the sample size is so small that I think it's really inconclusive overall. I wonder if you have any insights from the field. You know, I think that we're kind of talking from like a scientific study standpoint, but I'm curious about just folks that you chat with. Well, I think like part of what you're what you're saying as far as like, okay, like partially tapering, like if I taper like 50% of my antidepressant, do I get more effect? And I would say that the answer to that question to me is like clear as mud. And I think that most of the time, the antidepressant blocks serotonin reuptake strongly enough. And what they taper to is still going to be at or above psychiatry's minimum effective dose for the antidepressant. To the point where, yes, they're taking less antidepressant. Does that change how they're thinking and feeling somewhat? Probably. Does it change their responses to psychedelics? I'm not super bullish on it. Whereas I do have a few persons or I have a few persons reported that they are, for whatever reason, just taking ultra low doses of of antidepressants. And they do tend to get some more effect or maybe even effect to psychedelics like MDMA. Like if you're on escitalopram or Lexapro two and a half milligrams and i've heard the that minimum, the minimum effective dose for psychiatry is thought to be around maybe five to ten milligrams probably more commonly 10 milligrams and i've had a few persons sort of report that yeah i get this really nice euphoric positive emotionally opening and processing kind of effect out of mdma while taking that whereas most persons on standard dose of antidepressants is just kind of like that just totally duds But yeah, I mean, I think that, I don't know, maybe I've been a little bit remiss and not collecting more systematic data and like really trying to like look and like figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I haven't noticed any necessarily real clear trend as far as, you know, if you're on sertraline 100 milligrams versus sertraline 75, or I say sertraline 200 milligrams versus 50 to 100 milligrams. Is there any clear difference for me there? Not that I've really like noticed. Interesting. Could there be differences? Are most drug interactions dose dependent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's just it. Is like we're missing a whole lot of information about if there are specific agents or specific dose thresholds that really trigger this blunting effect with psychedelics, mm-hmm. or whether it's a lot more variable because the benefits of antidepressants are very variable mm-hmm. overall, and et cetera. Yeah, it's it, and also just this, uh, you know, you're speaking from a pharmacological standpoint, which is so, so valuable, I think, to our listeners. And I'll also add on that there's the subjective component as well. You know, if somebody is tapering off, no matter how long of a protocol, and let's say, for example, that they haven't been used to addressing feelings or sensations in their body and don't have the tools to navigate that, well, that also factors into how challenging of a taper process that individual might go through, how challenging of a psychedelic process that individual might go through if they don't even have the emotional tools and skill set, the cognitive tools and skill set, if the antidepressants were actually blocking them from feeling their feelings, like the whole skill of fully feeling your feelings and being safe in an environment where that can be productive and meaningful is a whole thing in itself. And I too have heard that. I've heard a lot of folks talk about actually microdosing psilocybin in conjunction with antidepressants 
I like what you were saying, which is actually microdosing the antidepressant, <laughs> which is a pretty interesting, you know, you know, phenomenon there. I've even heard that uh, one one of my medical professional friends said that actually, like a very low microdose of, I believe, Lexapro can help with some of the serotonin crash after an MDMA, you know, experience. So there's certainly some relationship there for sure. And we're just seeing folks online discuss the potential advantages of combining low doses of SSRIs with psychedelics, of which you're, you know, talking about, you know, there. And I wonder how prevalent that is, how widespread that is. I'm just curious your uh, opinion on, you know, what factors contribute to whether that's successful or or a drawback for somebody. Would to like add microdoses to an antidepressant regimen? Or? I think both ways. Some folks are are microdosing in conjunction of tapering. I know that some folks are microdosing psilocybin generally or LSD. Um, while staying on their regular dose of antidepressants. I think what's more interesting is that folks who are not, who don't have a history of antidepressants are taking low doses of SSRIs in conjunction with their psychedelics. That That's kind of the new interesting thing that I've, I've been seeing. That is new and interesting. I'm curious if that's if that's something that you've ran across or what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think that there's room for customizing doses of drugs and medications for for persons. And yeah, some people really do respond to, okay, maybe 10 milligrams of Lexapro is the typical starting dose for depression. Maybe if the person really leans to an anxious or even panic sort of predisposition, you know, the guidance is to start lower at like five milligrams. Maybe if you have that anxious sort of predisposition, you're panic and you're 65 years old or over and you're antidepressant naive, maybe starting at two and a half milligrams starts to, to make sense. And different persons will kind of feel more with different doses of medications. And I think this is a really interesting conversation about numbing effects of antidepressants or emotional repressant kind of effects. And I think it's a distinct possibility with psychiatric medications. I meet a lot of people that report that kind of phenomena with lots of different types of psychiatric uh, medications. I meet some other people talking about how they had a very reactive kind of emotional predisposition because of complex PTSD and not great programming growing up and, and things like that. And the use of the antidepressant just creates a bit of space between their thoughts and their feelings. Or other persons that felt that, you know, the stress was so overwhelming, you know, it's, it's like there, there's no buffer. There's no mm -hmm. buffer. It's it just like all of a sudden, any sort of stressful event occurs and I'm completely overwhelmed. Whereas they started taking this antidepressant and these stressful events are much more manageable for me. And I can kind of pause and think and put it in context mm -hmm. and make decisions about what to do from it without necessarily getting uh, overwhelmed, right? So it almost seems like two sides of the same coin or maybe within a spectrum of effect is that, you know, some people are going to experience this kind of zombification, numbing, overdone, emotional repressant sort of effect. And maybe some aspects of that in a lighter way, or maybe those same aspects in a person with a different kind of upbringing and raising and emotional, I don't know, tone overall, like that, that's an amazing effect for them. And it's a life changing and wonderful, positive kind of effect, right? So I don't know, antidepressants are probably over prescribed to persons that have mild to moderate levels of depression and anxiety with standard types of, you know, life stressors and events. They may actually be under prescribed to certain types of persons that have more severe types of illnesses or or, or symptoms. And some of these emotional numbing, emotional repressant kinds of effects may actually be the benefit that another person is looking for in that type of, of therapy or, or medication. I think of psychedelics as inherently things that tend to increase the amount of emotion, increase the amount of feeling a person uh, has. They tend to brighten mood and, and affect like overall. But I would say like the number one side effect that has been consistently reported in both surveys and now small clinical studies of microdosing is heightened anxiety, right? Or, you know, maybe even heightened neuroticism 
with kinds of long-term intermittent small dose administration or microdose administration of, of psychedelics. So yeah, like what should a person do? What's right for me? I mean, this is why we have hour long consults and kind of like systematically go through people's background and, and what they've tried and what they want to try and what worked and what didn't, and what caused this and that. Cause at the end of the day, right, we're blending art and science. Yeah. I think that power of personal choice is my my major takeaway of what you're saying. And that that's that's what I would like to convey to our audience is that, you know, you take something that has a lot of variability like psychedelic experiences. You take something else that has a lot of variability like psychotropic medications, you combine them together. Guess what? You're gonna have a lot of variables to consider. And and I really ask folks to give yourself permission to figure out what works for you. For some folks, that's trial and error. For some folks, that's leaning more on the conservative side. For some folks, they're a little bit more like risk tolerant. But I think that they're in, in this space right now, <clears throat> everybody's looking for guidance. And in some type of way, folks can give away their power with that. When, you know, if, if a facilitator came and told me, hey, this is my tapering protocol that I have my clients go through and I've worked with 400 clients so you should taper off. Like, how is an individual who's new to psychedelics going to know the difference uh, or, 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 or how to advocate for themselves in that? And so I hope that there aren't facilitators doing that. But I also know that a lot of the experience that folks are, are relying on is anecdotal, is historical, is somewhat subjective, you know, to, to your point. And so that's my big message here. And I wonder, you know, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience that you feel like would be, you know, meaningful and, and valuable as if they are in a seat of trying to figure out, you know, what, what to do? Well, I think I'll just riff off your, your comments just a little bit more. It's kind of like, if I had to guess what the average is, and I don't really know what it what it is, right? But let's just say that we're we've got a new psychiatric medication and we give it to ten people. We'll just make the numbers really small and, and easy here. I'm kind of predicting that one and a half to two out of those ten people are gonna have some kind of adverse reaction where they're kind of like, How could this devil poison possibly ever be approved as a medicine that is just absolutely horrific? probably like one to two out of 10 people are going to be like, that was absolutely magic for me. It saved my life. And the other sort of seven out of 10 people are going to say oh, on a scale of one to 10, it may be one to three points better. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so I think that a lot of the time, you know, you have like a mean sort of effect, you know, maybe a median sort of effect, right? Those like six to seven out of 10 people that get some incremental kind of benefit, but it might not be as far as they were hoping it would go. You're going to have some people that it is the wrong answer mm. for them. And you're going to have some people that it's like, that was just right. Like, like, wow, I kind of found something. And then around this sort of, I see, say like theme of empowerment, right? It's like that, that's kind of the goal, right? It's like, I'm an internet information dealer. I'm not a consult with me and I tell you what to do sure. dealer, right? That, that's mm -hmm. actually kind of, it's maybe part of the business model I have right now because of the, the legality of psychedelics. But I was thinking about this the other week and well, let's just say psychedelics are all legal. Do I change my business model so that I recommend that they do it now? And I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure. So it's like, I actually don't think I, I would want to, mm -hmm. to go to that kind of space because I yeah. think my goal is empowerment. And I think that's part, part of the name spirit pharmacist is that, well, you are your own spirit. I don't know what's going to make you happy. I can be an expert information sounding board about different types of options and what's known about those options and how they mix with your regular types of meds or illnesses and, and things like that. But I'm actually not sure what's actually going to work for the person. And so sometimes I do get consultations and I'll say it goes either way. Mm. You know, sometimes people, it's kind of like we get to the end of the hour, like 50 minutes in and it's like, well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And it's like, what do you mean? Like, mm -hmm. like which one should Give I? Give me the like, answer. Aren't you, gonna tell me what to do? <laughs> aren't you gonna tell me what to do? And it's like, well, I can tell you what I would start with if I was you, but no, I can't tell you what to do and, and don't really want to. Um, cause they're so used to basically superseding the mm -hmm. power of their health to whatever kind of doctor yeah. or provider medical authority figure that they are just completely disempowered to actually make any kind of decision about which option they, they want to take. And I have to tell you that 
you know, there's less data around some psychedelics, psychedelic practices, mm-hmm. microdosing, things like that, than some other areas of medicine or even psychiatry. But boy, how many people have we heard saying, my psychiatrist doesn't know what to do. They treated me as a guinea pig. It's all trial and error. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's like, that's kind of reality, right? Is like the kind of reality is, is that as a mental health doctor, you kind of have a guess. They present in a certain sort of flavor and a certain kind of predisposition with certain kinds of symptoms that are more consistent with these sets of illnesses mm-hmm. and these other sets of illnesses. Mm-hmm. And you have these medications that are more consistent with benefit for those sets of illnesses. So you pick something and try something there. But a lot of people are feeling like that process is protocolized to the extent that the doctor knows that that's just going to produce like a positive kind of Mm -hmm. result. And I think for the most part, yeah, offering encouragement that it will, because that is the mean or median kind of, of result out there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's why I say, like, how should I taper my antidepressant? You know, what should I do? 10 to 25% decreases every two to four weeks is tolerated. I give that massive range and I give actual numbers for people that they can put in their heads and their brains. So it's not, I took a 15% dose decrease. It's been two weeks. What should I do now? Well, you know, we can have a conversation about the rates and the timeframes and what you might do if you feel certain ways, right? And I'm happy to be the informational sounding board that kind of all right, this is what I would do, Mal. This is sort of sounds like where we're at. Like these are some things we might want want to do, right? I'm like here to help and like support that, right? Rather than kind of like, all right, toss it in the deep end. You can figure it out. Like kind, yeah. kind of kind of approach. But I really am trying to get people to understand what are my medications doing for me? What happens if I increase or decrease the dose? And what time frames do I notice those types of things? Because with that information, there's so much closer to being able to be a steward for their own kind of like mental health and kind of really weigh in and advocate for themselves in the doctor's office about what they actually may need or what they want to do rather than, why don't you just tell me what to do? I'm not sure if that's what I want because I don't know about any of the options, right? It just sort of, yeah. So I think that's part of the new paradigm in, in mental health that it's less like the doctor controls my head and tells me what to do and a lot more education about what the medication is, what they might feel, and how to respond with dosing of the medication based on those kinds of feelings. Yeah. And I, I, I'm so, so appreciative, so appreciative of all of your thoughts and what you were saying about, you know, folks superseding their power. We see that in other cultures as well. Like we see that in shamanic psychedelic work, where if you are in general, I'm speaking broadly, But if you are going to work in a shamanic context in psychedelics, they're kind of calling the shots, like the conversations around consent or practice, or if they need to have some type of a a spiritual intervention or whatever, that's usually at the whim of that uh, shamanic practitioner. And so my real takeaway here with what you just said is that a part of psychedelics is reclaiming your power, reclaiming your sovereignty, reclaiming your autonomy. And like, let's do that, you know? So I'm so appreciative. Yeah, let's make it part and parcel with what psychedelics are. Right. Let's not, oh, uh, you've got to hire two therapists to be the conduit of your healing. You won't heal unless you do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some people are going to need extra help and support. Your your symptoms are are severe. You're new to psychedelics, right? It's like if you go to a, a, a new city or you're climbing a mountain, hiring an expert guide or a Sherpa is a pretty damn good idea. Right. But after you've been walking around that city or hiked that mountain a couple of times, you should be aiming to not need a Sherpa or a mm-hmm. tour guide to go around that mm-hmm. place any anymore. Like, the, like that's just kind of part of how it is. Like, let's not confuse the moon for the p- finger that that points at the moon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ben. This has been an awesome conversation. You can find more of Ben's work at www.spiritpharmacist.com um, and get an overview of Ben's services, how he serves the community. Um, I understand that you have consultations and then you have larger like group community offerings. So definitely go and check that out at spiritpharmacist.com. That wraps up our episode. Uh, So thank you so much, Ben. Uh, Before we go, I'll read a quick testimonial from uh, an an individual who went through a ceremonial program within our referral facilitator network. They said, I felt seen and taken care of, yet lots of room for me to show up however I needed. 
uh, no expectations, not manage. That is the type of testimonial and feedback that I love to hear uh, when individuals go through a facilitated psychedelic experience. So thank you for that. Um, You can find our episodes anywhere that you get podcasts, primarily Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and then we also upload videos onto YouTube. Thank you so much for being here with us this week, and we look forward to seeing you next time. 